Tēnā mana e nā reo e nā kāranga taha maha o te au. Tēnā koutou katoa e te mana whenua. Ko tēnā rohe nā i tua huriri. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou nā mihi nui ki o koutou. Ko e kon vietaka wingoe he kamati i te kure, kure umanga nei. Ko a rangi, ko nā te inio, ko jata hapu, ko sing te whana. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou nā mihi nui ki a koutou e hoa maa. Good evening. My name is Eikant Veer. It is my pleasure to welcome you here to this Tāheri UC Connect lecture. Um, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into tonight's event. Uh, it is a chilly night, and so people might still be finding their way in, because I believe these Connect lectures are usually done somewhere else, uh, and um, there are some exams on. That is our fault. I believe it's a Marketing 100 exam happening right now. And so the rooms are being used for core business at the moment, so people might still uh, filter in. That is fine. If there is an emergency of any form, then we will just slowly filter out. Emily, give us a wave. Emily is our helper at the back, she, and Angeline is outside. Anything goes wrong, follow her. We have exits here, and we'll congregate somewhere on campus. Follow Emily. Um, if you need to use the Faripaku, there are outside as well. There's a gents out here, and then down the stairs there is a ladies' toilet as well. In the event of a shaking uh, event, in an event of an earthquake, we do the standard thing of drop, cover, hold, wait for the shaking to stop, and then exit. I am hoping that being in the engineering building, this place is safe. <laughs> we will be fine. Um, late last year, I was asked, oh no, it might have even have been mid last year, uh, the team asked me if I'd be willing to do a UC Connect lecture for the 150th anniversary, which is this year for UC. And I said, I'd absolutely be honored, and I would love to have someone else do most of the work and me ride on their coattails. I didn't phrase it that way, but that was effectively what I was <laughs> suggesting. Given that I knew that Professor Stacey Wood was going to be joining us for as an Erskine scholar, and I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to celebrate some of the work that Stacey's been doing, match it up with some of the work I've been doing in New Zealand, and share it with hopefully some interesting people. And so we have them here, we have people on the live stream as well. Um, Stacy Wood is the Langdon Distinguished Professor of Marketing at North Carolina State University, the current co-editor of the journal Consumer Research, a past president of the Association Consumer Research. She has a research career that spans longer than a very, very long thing, uh, and the CV itself would take forever to read out, so we won't waste our time there. She also has 14 teaching awards from both North Carolina and Duke University, <laughs> as well as other places. It isn't a competition, but she is winning at the moment. Um, uh, and, and I've known Stacy for, what, 10, 15 years, I at think, uh, as, as a colleague, as a researcher, as a leader, as someone who is, just holds so much integrity within the field. And in the past few weeks you've been here as an Erskine scholar, I'm already gonna get emotional. I've got to know you more as a person, your whānau, as an extended part of my whānau, and as a deep, deep friend. So it is a real honor, Stacey, to welcome you to take the stage to talk to us about your research. The plan is Stacey's going to take 20 to 25 minutes. I've told her I'll give her a five-minute warning and give her a countdown from there, and then I'll take over after then, and then we'll have questions. We do ask that you um, wait for the, the, the question time, just because there'll be a lot of questions, I'm sure, Pause for that time. We've got a couple of people running around with microphones as well, so that other people can hear the questions. But otherwise, Stacey, over to you, Ehor. Take the stage. Thank you, dear friend. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. The, the 20 straight flying hours to get here were worth it just to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say thank you first uh, for the opportunity to be here as an Erskine Fellow. Uh, it's an amazing program. Uh, it is the dream of a lifetime to come to New Zealand. I have enjoyed everything about my time here, and uh, I'm spending my last three weeks here basically scheming how to get back. Um, and I know this is probably what most Americans do when they come here, but I will, I will follow them. It, this is a, an amazing place to be. Um, one of the w things I really like about, um, uh, about traditions here is to say where you're from as part of the introduction to any talk, especially your career work that you do. And while as um, an American, like many uh, Americans, I don't really have a place that I grew up, any one place or any one place that I identify with. You keep Am on. I not on? No, it's just, oh, it's all fallen. It's just a rookie mistake. How many are teaching awards? Uh, they weren't for tech, obviously. <laughs> all right. What, what did I do? Uh, that's all right. That's okay. 
There we are. See, you, you were too kind. It got me all kerfuffled, um, muddled. Um, but I feel like the connections can be made in my family. So I want to um, introduce myself to you by showing you a photograph of my parents um, right before I came into the world. So this is Wade and Marsha Wood in San Francisco, California. Um, they are bright eyed and beautiful. My dad's a civil engineer. He builds, at that time he was building bridges. Now he uh, ended his career with building power plants and my mom's a nurse. So they raised me to be a problem solver and to care about others. Um, they also desperately had a competition where uh, my mom wanted me to be a doctor and my dad wanted me to be an engineer because that was the only honorable profession in the world, um, according to engineers. Um, and I disappointed both of them horribly by getting a PhD in marketing. In fact, when I told them I was gonna get a PhD in marketing, uh, they were living in India at the time, and I can remember over this you know, kind of tenuous uh, phone connection, my dad said, what? Can you even do that? And I said, yes, yes, you can get a PhD in marketing. He's like, well, what'd you do with it? I said, oh, I'll, I'll teach in a university. And he just kind of went, I thought you were my smart one. <laughs> ah, well. So um, the other thing you should probably know is that um, I am a lifelong mystery reader, and I love the golden age of mysteries. And so these are my top five. And this is serious. This is a serious top five list. I'm not going to pander to you by putting Nio Marsh at number one. She is number two. Um, but really, honestly, there's a break in the curve. Uh, I would consider her far above Agatha Christie, even though I know that's sort of a scandalous thing to say to some. But we can discuss mysteries later. But the thing is, is that from a young age, New Zealand was a magical place to me because Nio Marsh was from there. And to, I gave a class uh, two weeks ago in the Nio Marsh Theater. And I walked past her portrait. I took a picture of her portrait. And then right next to the portrait is a sign saying, that way, Nio Marsh Theater. And that way, room of requirement. I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. You know, Harry Potter, um, Nio Marsh. Uh, it's a magical place here. So it feels a little bit like I have come to a good place tonight in this very cold evening um, to talk a little bit about work I started doing in 2015. So in 2015, I met Ke uh, Kevin Schulman, who is now at Stanford. He was at Duke. Um, and we started talking um, about research, as uh, geeky academics do. And he is a medical doctor and teaches at the intersection of clinical informatics technology and basically what will healthcare of the future look like. And I told him all about consumer behavior, which is what I do. Basically, how do people make choices about things? And I said, more and more patients have agency in the world. How will they make choices about healthcare? And we got to big discussions. And so um, he convinced me and, and offered me the opportunity to teach a class at the Duke School of Medicine, and I've been doing that ever since. So I teach a class in clinical informatics. Um, it's to people who are already doctors, hospital administrators, um, nursing administrators, um, basically people who are trying to set the stage for the future of healthcare. Um, and for a long time, I've been saying this one particular thing to these classes, which is that we, as a global um, community, are at a unique inflection point because of technology, because of the demands of healthcare, um, that we really have a lot of innovative things we can do for the health of populations. And my fellow um, feeling, as uh, biased as it is as a marketing professor, is that medical and public health schools need to offer some training in consumer behavior and decision making. That if you are trained as a caregiver, and you are going to be talking to people who have choices about the treatments they take, the healthy behaviors they enact or don't enact, we kind of need to know how that works. And that this is a science, despite my father's you know, real questioning of whether marketing can be called a science, there is a science that, that looks at this. Now, I found that uh, <laughs> COVID-19 offered a global proof of this. It was an interesting time for all of us. For me, it was a really interesting time because what happened is that because I had been talking since 2015 about looking at how people make decisions and make choices about healthcare, and now suddenly we need people to make some pretty important decisions about healthcare and to do it in kind of a quick way, um, I 
uh, was working with uh, Departments of Health and Human Service in the US. Um, I started giving them lots of advice on how to develop communications at first to urge people for stay at home, um, uh, times of staying at home, uh, then later for mask wearing. Um, Kevin called me and said, hey, let's write a paper together. And <laughs> I don't know. You know, you say yes to something and your life just takes this arc, right? Like who knows what you say yes to and just like life takes an arc. So I said yes and life took an arc because that paper got published in the New England Journal of Medicine and suddenly I was an expert. What should we do? I was like, okay. Um, I got calls from all manner of newspapers and governmental agencies and all these people saying, what should we do and how can we do this? And I'm like, well, you know, there's some basic marking things that we could do to give people information about the choices they can make. Um, I got so many, I was once interviewed for a long haul truckers radio station, a radio station that's played just to truckers um, driving across the South. Um, obviously they cared a lot about uh, the health of people across the US. Um, I got a call from, or I got an email from a guy saying he wanted to interview me and he just said that he wrote for a science journal. And I was so tired of giving interviews at that point, it's not what academics do easily. Um, that I said, okay, um, uh, I'm so busy, but sure. And so we had this lovely conversation and um, at the end I said, um, so which, which science journal do you write for? And he said, I write for science, the journal. I went, oh, oh my gosh, I almost said no to that. So it got published in science and my, the chancellor of my university actually emailed me personally to say, hey, I just opened up my science today and you were in it. I was like, but it went even further. I got emails from just the WH. The Biden administration would like to have an opinion on blah, blah, blah. What could you tell us? Okay. I was asked to uh, talk at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and then I started meeting celebrities. Oh, before that, oh, before the celebrities, well, I guess we can call uh, Mohammed Pate a celebrity. So I wrote a paper with the guy to the left, a Nigerian doctor who was um, critical in um, eradicating polio from Nigeria. Um, that's, you can see he's being looked at with great respect by Bill Gates. Um, the World Bank asked me to do work um, with Dr. Pate to look at um, encouraging vaccination. Then I met some celebrities. I worked with NASCAR drivers to help convince um, certain populations in the US to consider vaccination. Um, I worked with Kerry Washington on um, a campaign to help people learn how to talk to loved ones with love. Um, it's a hard thing sometimes to talk to loved ones with love um, about uh, attitudes and ideas around vaccination. I mean, it's a touchy subject and the whole point of it is agency, right? It's a choice. Um, uh, I will say that Kerry Washington, I would have Zoom meetings with her and she is as amazing um, in real life as she is in the movies. and. Um, uh, my husband would just sort of linger in the background walking by just in case Kerry Washington wanted to meet him too. Um, she, she never did, ha. Huh? Um, and then to top off this um, kind of riotous uh, two years, um, I got to come to New Zealand and meet Sir Ashley Bloomfield. And we talked together with ACONT um, about all manner of public health challenges that are gonna be coming up. It's been a crazy time. Um, and I think the reason why it happened is because this basic idea of learning more about how people make decisions and choices in medicine and healthcare is really truly important. The pandemic did it. So we're gonna talk about the pandemic. What did we learn from this? But I really want you to think beyond this. How are we making choices about all manner of other um, public health issues? So I study consumer behavior. Consumer behavior is looking at how people make choices. And I like to think of it as um, the, the core of engineering, the logical utility, with the wrapping of psychology, all the context and environmental um, decision structures surrounded by anthropology or the culture or the society or the meaning that we assign our choices. So in consumer behavior, we look at things and say, why would someone, what are the, the, what's the net benefits to them? Why would they want to do that? Um, what is the choice architecture around them that pushes them this way and that? And then what kind of narrative does this have? So 
You can think of, in healthcare, this might mean like, look, we gotta know if people have health literacy, right? Like that's the logical reason why someone might want to um, engage in a healthy behavior. If I walk, will that make me healthier? All right, well, I need to know something about walking and I need to know what kind of benefits it might have. Then nudges and choice architecture are things that um, uh, sway my decision um, one way or another. They can be things that I'm paying attention to or I'm not paying attention to. And then ultimately wrapped around this is that my choices say something about my identity. My choices have meaning to me personally and I really need to have a sense of trust in order to kind of wrap all this around uh, um, kind of the nugget of the choice. So I wanna give you an example. Um, and this example is one that um, is just so robust. So there's a common um, decision heuristic uh, called the compromise effect. So let's imagine that you are going to a lecture and it's in the middle of the day and um, you don't know how interesting it's gonna be and you don't know how much coffee you're gonna to need to drink. Who knows, you want a little bit of coffee, a lot of coffee, a middle amount of coffee. You just don't know how much caffeine you need. And so when you go up to the counter, if you're in the US, there's a Starbucks within 20 feet of you, no matter where you are in the country. Um, I, I think that's actually statistically correct. Um, what might seem like the most reasonable is the middle one. Have you ever done that? You don't know how much you want of something, and so you get the middle. We often do it with wine choices. Which wine is the best one on the thing? Do we get the cheapest wine? No. Do we get the most expensive wine? No. Do we look for the prices right in the middle? Yes. And oftentimes that's because we don't know. Um, and even though it's a decision heuristic, it's something that nudges us towards a particular choice. It's um, not that weird. It's not that crazy or illogical. It's actually just an intuition of a normal distribution, right? A bell curve. A bell curve says that normal choices are in the middle and freakish choices are on the ends. Normal, freak. And so um, I have found in my life with engineers that you can say a lot of things. And what engineers will say to you is like, oh, yes, I can see how people would do this compromise effect thing. Yes, I can. They would do it. And I say, no, Dad, we all do this. And he goes, no, I wouldn't do it. I'm an engineer. I pick based on what's right. I say, no, no, we all do this. And so I have found that doctors are even worse at this. So when I'm teaching doctors, they're like, oh, people are so strange. They, I'm like, no, no, you all are. So here's what I've done is that I have found, oops, am I going the wrong way now? Yes. Um, I have found that it's best if I send a little survey out before I teach a class, especially to doctors. And I give them this scenario. I say, imagine that a friend has asked you to dinner and you're on the way over, it's a casual dinner, the friend texts you to say, hey, can you stop at the New World on your way over or the countdown or the whatever um, and buy a jar of artichoke hearts. I need it for my recipe and I've forgotten. And you say, sure. And so you go to the store and you find out that there's the Polar brand for $1.79, the Reese brand for $2.69, and the Delalo brand for $3.49. Which would you choose? So in your minds, don't yell it out, because that would be chaos. Just in your mind, think about which one would you choose? You got three brands going over to a friend's for dinner, casual dinner. Okay, so got it in your mind. Well, what I found is that when I asked half of my class this question, There's the compromise effect, right? Half of them go, I don't know. I don't want the $1.79 ones. Those are cheap. I don't want the, what was it, $3.49? That's expensive. I'll get the middle ones. Now, does it explain everybody? No. There's still the people who are like, they're artichoke hearts. They're disgusting. I'm just getting the cheapest ones. And there are other people who are like, oh, I'm going over to a friend's house for dinner. I need to get the best ones. So it doesn't explain everything, but we can see the tendency. Now, the interesting thing here is that, oops, I keep going backwards. The interesting thing here is that we do this primarily when uncertainty is higher, meaning I use artichoke hearts because none of us really know the brands or know really anything about them or have good strong price points in our head. So we do this more when, when uncertainty is high, which I would argue is often the case in healthcare. And it suggests that I can predict what people are going to choose by looking at the array that they are offered. 
So let's imagine that we go back to this case, and I've got that Delalo brand. It's only at 22%. It's the extreme choice, right? So it's, it's being hurt. What if it wasn't the extreme choice? What if there was another brand on the shelf? So half of my class sees this condition, where now they're choosing from among four. Now, keep in mind that Delalo was at 22% before. I have changed nothing about Delalo, not the price, not the size, nothing. Now, knowing about compromise effect, you now can predict that choice is going to be higher. It's hugely higher. When I teach this to MBA students, I'm like, all right, I have just paid for your MBA. Use this for every you know, proposal you ever write for consulting. Again, you know, always have three choices. Always, make, always understand people are going to go for the middle one. Um, but what does this mean for medicine? It means that we often don't know how much risk is risk. We don't understand how much pain is pain. And when we're offered arrays of things like trade-offs, sometimes we're like, well, I don't know. Let's go for the middle one. So in the US, we choose healthcare. Our healthcare plan can be the bare bones cheapest, it can be the middle one, or it can be the bells and whistles most expensive. And most of us have a hard time predicting how much healthcare we'll need next year. And so we choose the middle one. The middle plan, no matter what it looks like, is always the most popular plan for any company that offers an array of healthcare. In the pandemic, it meant that when we were talking about masks, you could look at masks and you could say, okay, first there's the logical utility of mask. It has a good payoff for how costly it is to implement. A mask is cheap. It's cheap to wear, it's easy to wear, it cuts down infection rates by a, um, a, a significant number. So that was just the logical utility of it. Around that is the choice architecture. So at, in um, my university, NC State University, a lot of professors said it was OK to wear masks because we were told, well, there's kind of like three things we could do. We could either have you wear nothing, or you could wear a mask, or you could wear a mask and a visor. Like it kind of like went like this. And people are like, uh, this seems like too much. Nothing seems like not enough. A mask seems like a good idea. Now, if they had just said you could wear nothing or a mask, then it's like, oh, there's no middle option. But just making one more extreme thing of doing the mask. Did you see those masks that had visors, face visors? Yes. So that was a nudge towards wearing a mask. But then there's trust and identity. And in the US, the way this played out is that early on, identity around masks, some people wore masks and felt like superheroes. They felt like they were saving the world, a social champion. Other people felt like they were weak if they wore a mask, that they were um, gullible. And so it really became wearing a mask had a sense of identity for people. Some people had to wear masks, but they still felt like one of these two things. So this is the way consumer behavior might impact just, um, just mask wearing. Um, and so like I said, Kevin and I wrote this paper um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what it did was it said, hey, this really goes beyond politics. This is not a red state, blue state discussion. People aren't for vaccination if they're Democrats and against vaccination if they're Republicans. No matter what the news told, told you, it wasn't like that. You could go into states like Florida and find a very complicated sort of um, identity shift going on. And so when Kevin asked me, he said, how would you predict the rate at which people are going to adopt vaccinations? I said, oh, I just use Everett Rogers diffusion of innovation model. It's the model that has described most accurately any diffusion over the last 100 years. And you can see it starts out slow with innovators, kind of starts to pick up a little with early adopters, hits a trajectory with the early majority, slows down with the late majority, and stops with the laggards. I was like, I'd use this. And when I told this to people um, in the government, in the Biden administration, they were like, oh no, we're in a pandemic. This is a life-saving drug. It's not going to start off like that. It's going to shoot like that. And we just have to be ready for everyone to be pounding on the door wanting a vaccine. And I was like, actually, here's how, remember how awesome electricity was? Like, it took time to diffuse. Refrigerators, that was a great invention. Still took some time. The color TV was real quick because we actually already liked black and white TVs and just switching to color was an easy thing to do. 
But even the microwave oven took some time. Like all innovations take a little bit of time. And so what I argued, um, and uh, uh, Kevin and I argued together, is that uh, you really had to use these 12 behavioral kinds of tactics to try and um, encourage people uh, in whatever particular healthy choice. Now, I will say that I am making an assumption that what doctors are telling us to do is a smart and good thing. I am not a medical official. I cannot give information on whether or not doctors are giving us good information. But predicated on the assumption doctors are giving us good information, doctors could use these kinds of things to help promote this new thing. Because in essence, as uh, Kevin was very fond of saying, that vaccine was the most important product innovation of our lifetimes. You know, more important than the iPhone, right? Like it was the most important. And so um, uh, the paper um, is available for free. It's open source um, uh, at New England Journal of Medicine. I definitely, if you're interested, encourage you to go and download a copy. It goes through each of these in, um, uh, uh, in detail. And the other thing that we did is we took and we said, okay, look, you're going to have people who are really interested in getting the vaccine, and you're going to have people who are less interested in getting the vaccine, and the things you should do should go in order. So the very first things you should do are to try and get those people who are definitely yes. What kinds of things can you do there? Well, it's all about accessibility, ease, but also promoting word of mouth and observability. Um, uh, we, we suggested in our paper, maybe people would have stickers. And we're like, look, there were stickers. Um, I don't know if I personally made all those stickers, but I'm sorry if I did. Um, there were a lot of stickers. Um, uh, then for the probably yeses, after you've done all that for the um, definitely yeses, then you've got to go and create reminders and salience cues. I often use as an example uh, my own slowness in getting a mammogram. I need to get a mammogram. My physician has mentioned it several times. But what happens is I forget. And so I need a cue. It's not that I'm against getting one. I will get one. It's just I need a cue. Um, so what kind of triggers? What kind of act now? Um, I don't know if my mammogram, if the place that does um, radiology in my hometown suddenly said, uh, you know, we're going to have a mimosas and mammograms day. Come in on, you know, XYZ day and get a mimosa. And I'd be like, oh, yeah. I will sign up now. Not that I wasn't going to get one, but it just gives me that mind like, oh, there's something kind of cool and funny going on. I'll do that. Um, the probably knows now we got to get to actually changing someone's mind. So now there are a lot of different things. You can use nudges, but now it becomes a lot more about identity. It becomes a lot more about finding trusted medical advocates. And then when you get down to the definitely knows, sometimes, and the answer that I gave to doctors is they're like, how do we convince those people? And I'm like, sometimes you just don't. And sometimes you don't actually really even try. But if you want to try, you're going to have to make sure that you avoid judgment and patronization. You're going to have to understand that your way is not always the best way. You're going to have to look for ways that the narrative will allow for changed opinions without a loss of face. Right? So if you've made a hardcore decision and it's based on your identity, what is the narrative that allows you to say, and now I've shifted? whatever that is. Um, and so again, you can see if we go back to this kind of tenets of consumer behavior, what we're talking about is that in the beginning, we talk a lot about logical utility, health literacy. Here's why this works. Here's why it's good for you. Here are the stats. And then we start moving to heuristics as we get into people who, aren't, um, who need nudges and reminders. And then we get into culture as we start talking to people who um, are, who, who, who are not convinced. And if we go back to the Rogers diffusion of innovation curve, you might ask yourself, um, so what happened here? Um, did COVID uh, vaccination follow this pattern? And look, there it is. That's it in the US, like beautifully. And the thing is, is that this uh, data is up till um, uh, June of uh, 2021. And when I got this at this point, they're like, well, you know, we're not all the way in. Can you, based on this, can you tell where we'll, we'll top out? I was like, well, yeah, you just pump, you know, punch the numbers into um, the model and we punched them in. And I said, you know, it's, it looks like it's about you know, 69, 70%. And 
and it ended up being 68%. So it's like we have the tools to make these predictions. Um, we went on to think about, okay, um, uh, to what extent are some people like truly like thinking and very involved in saying, no, this vaccination is not for me. That's a high involvement decision maker. First is someone who's just like, what? There's a pandemic? Eh. Like there were lots of people who didn't get vaccinated because it just wasn't top of their to-do list. Now that could be because they had a lot on their plate because their job was unsteady. They had food scarcity issues. Or it could be that they were just in a more remote area with a lower infection rate, or they were young and felt healthy. And so we really used that um, with that campaign with Kerry Washington, where we said, um, I'm gonna, ooh, my laser pointer works. Um, we said, look, some people are low involvement decision makers. They aren't really thinking about this. Um, how do you talk to that group versus high involvement decision makers? They have thought a lot about this decision, and it is a strong no for them. And again, it, there are about four different um, templates of information that are at this website, thecostsofwaiting.com, that are free for download. Um, so I encourage you to go and look at them. But it was all about how could I have a conversation with someone? Um, and the interesting thing is that when you're talking to a low involvement decision maker, the sorts of things that convince them are completely different from the sorts of things that convince someone who's a high involvement decision maker. So you could really accidentally do the wrong thing. You take a low involvement decision maker and you sit down and you say, look, I want to show you some graphs and statistics and credible information. They're just like, oh, you know, their, their brain's gone. You take the high involvement decision maker um, and you give them that, that might be great. You tell the high involvement decision maker, look, 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 just go and get it. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a pony if you get the vaccine. Um, and they're like, oh, I would never, ever do something for my health just for a pony. And you tell the low involvement decision, look, look, I'll buy you a slice of pizza. And they're like, oh, OK. You know, so like, these are different things that work with different people. Um, um, then came the work with Mohamed Pate, where basically we took these 12 strategies um, and we tested them all over the world. We tested them in seven different global regions that the World Bank um, uh, looks at to find out which ones worked in different places. It was so interesting. I will say that I really thought they'd all work everywhere, which was really actually a silly hypothesis when you stop to think about it, and it was not true. Different things worked better in different areas. The three I've highlighted are the universals. These one were the tops in all global regions. The first one is, is if you want to explain to people how things work, use analogies. Analogies are one of the biggest ways we learn. So when you say, what's a mRNA vaccine and how does it work? You can use an analogy. You can say, it's like injecting a teacher into your arm. The teacher sits there, teaches everyone how to fight off the, um, the virus, and then goes home. Um, I told my kids it was like a, a, a karate instructor, right? Teaches you how to fight off the bad guys. Um, use analogies. Analogies are a learning tool. Another thing was to predict and address negative attributions. People make negative attributions all the time. Um, so for example, if um, somebody had the vaccine and then later got a stomach ache, they'd be like, ha, 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 ha. And a lot of healthcare providers were like, well, do we talk about that and bring attention to it or should we just ignore it? And so one of the things that was important was that you actually have to sort of predict these and address them. And finally, you need to neutralize the base rate fallacy, which is the idea that um, uh, people are more prone to remember and be persuaded by anecdotal evidence than statistical evidence. This is one time when my engineer dad is right. People are kind of silly. We love a good story. Stories are predictive. Um, and we ignore them over statistics. So when you are a scientist and you're trying to persuade, oftentimes you bring your big gun statistics and then it just takes one person with a story about their aunt's friend, Mabel, and it's all out in the wash. So as a doctor, use your own stories. I have a patient just like you, and this is what happened to them. Use stories. So basically, what have I learned? I learned that if you build it, they will come is a terrible marketing strategy. <laughs> also, thank you for laughing at my Field of Dreams reference. Um, but that's how I'm afraid we thought about the vaccine in the US. We had a big push 
to try and bring it all together. And then we just expected that everyone would line up at the pharmacy to get their jab. Um, I personally talked to so many doctors who were and like wept with how exhausted they were and how much work they had put in. And the fact that people just wouldn't get the jab, they took very personally. So it really was a shame. Um, but I also feel like there's a science that addresses this and we can be better prepared next time. So with that, um, Akon is going to talk more specifically about what happened here uh, in New Zealand. I know we haven't finished, but I think we should give her a clap, because that was amazing. <laughs> Mainly so it gives me a second to work out the microphone. Um, and as Stacey said, I wanted to talk a little bit about the local context. And um, I've done a few of these talks around health promotion and the role of marketing within promoting health. and good behavior and things. And so I was trying to think about how I would follow uh, on this year with this sort of talk. And I really wanted to focus on what we might have learned from the New Zealand experience. And so this is going to be more of a case study rather than a deep theoretical discussion. I'm more than happy to have those deep theoretical literature discussions with you if you want. That is not tonight, though. Um, New Zealand took a one-size-fits-all with its marketing and its communications. It decided that all the communications would be run out of Wellington. This is not something that I assume, this is something that we knew about because we try to create targeted communications for different groups, as Stacey recommended, down in uh, Waitahā, Canterbury, down in the city itself, we were told no. Everything goes through Wellington and Wellington gets to decide how the, the country will hear about the vaccine, how the country will hear about COVID. Now, there are some pros to this and there are some cons to this. Some of the pros associated with this, you get to decide what the narrative is gonna be centrally. You get to control how people hear about the science, what they hear, how it gets diffused out, and some of the benefits associated with that. That's really good. If you're leading a large organization, you kinda of wanna hear from the top, right? You don't want rumors to spread from the ground. So all the science came from there. Um, there's a consistency of message. If you say, here's the general vibe of what we want you to say, make it work for yourself, people might miscommunicate that or misinterpret that. None of that happened because it was the same message for everyone. Uh, drives all focus onto a single point of truth. You can say, this is where we should trust or whom we should trust, and this is why we should trust him or her. In this case, it was um, uh, Ashley Bloomfield, Jacinda Ardern, many of our health professionals around the country who were there. And so we knew that truth came from this singular source. Combined effort to ensure best evidence is at the forefront of all messaging. We could take the best of everyone in the country and we could focus it in one space rather than having this diffusion of everyone else making up decisions and then that being confusing. And then finally, you do get economies of scale. If we can sort, put all the funding into one space and all the knowledge into one place, hopefully we can achieve more than saying, here's a little bit of money for everyone, try and make a marketing campaign. New Zealand's a small place. We are also a space that is quite distributed um, population-wise over a large um, um, uh, physical space, and we don't have experts in every rural town to lead this. We do have other experts, though. We have context experts, but we'll get on to that in a bit. Some of the cons, I couldn't think of the right word. I was having a mind blank, so I went lack of flavor. What is the, what is the local flavor, vibe? Marbo of this thing, if anyone knows the castle. Um, lack of specific targeting needs and motivations. I could not go, and I tried this, and I'll talk about this in a second, I couldn't go and say, this is what our city needs right now. We need to do messaging around this because the Wellington messaging isn't work. Wasn't gonna happen. Difficult to get local buy-in as a result. How do we get people excited when we know that all the evidence is coming out of someone who we've never seen or touched or anything like that? We don't have any physical connection or spiritual or emotional or social connection to this person or this group. Can we get any local buy-in? And then finally, it does slow things down. If you do want to do something nuanced down here or anywhere else, it did all have to go through Wellington and sometimes it got approved, but there was this kind of rigmarole of bureaucracy which, which did slow things down. That's not the agility we needed when we were dealing with people's lives, in my mind. Um, I want to talk about 
the case rates. Now, these are people who had confirmed COVID cases, and this is by per 100,000. This is in New Zealand. This is across the three years up until last week when I extracted the data. Um, you can see that there's clearly a big spike around a certain point, and that was February 2022. That is a long time after the vaccine turned up and a long time after we knew about COVID, which was way back here. Just because I've got my American friend here, I thought I'd put the US data on there. <laughs> Now it's very different. Now this is the same scale. This is per 100,000 people. This is a very different experience overseas. We were very fortunate. We didn't exist when it came to COVID. And a few of us who were all in lockdown back here in March were going, what is the point? Where's the why? Then we're put in lockdown over here. What are you talking about? Why are we in lockdown again? All right. But now this happened. We're like, there's no lockdown happening now. What's going on? All right. The Americans, you can see why the lockdowns kind of existed. I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> this is a point when me and my colleagues realized there was a problem. You don't see it on the graph, but we already were able to see that there was a problem brewing in May 2021. We knew something was not going right. We knew that the marketing was not hitting, the comms weren't hitting, and we were already able to predict, based on what Stacey's already talked about, that what the diffusion was going to be was not going to be as effective as some of our doctors and our health professionals felt it would be. So in May 2021, um, myself and Katie Mills, uh, who was working with me at the time, started a project trying to understand specifically why youth are not buying into some of the messaging around COVID. Why are they not adopting the messaging? What are some of the things that is deterring them from either getting the vaccine when it gets available to them, which wasn't available at the time, but also why they're not adhering to some of the restrictions that were put in place. We took a very simple um, uh, approach because we, we felt that we had good connections with people. So we started with some qualitative interviews and some focus groups, 16 focus groups run by Katie and her colleagues across a variety of different groups in Ōtutahi Christchurch. Uh, and then we kept monitoring the quantitative data. We kept seeing the case rates, we kept seeing the vaccination uh, adoption, we kept measuring what was objectively coming through from the Ministry of Health at the time. And we were able to start to predict. And again, we don't want to say that this was obvious to us and it should have been obvious to others, but we kind of saw that it wasn't going to work as well as possible. And so we went to the Ministry of Health, with, well, to the population health team that were in charge of the vaccinations and said, you're missing a trick. We need to start addressing this with specific, targeted, nuanced messaging to make sure that our young people in particular are getting um, uh, the, 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 the message through. Uh, we took a needs and motivations based approach. And these are some of the common themes that came out from all our discussions and all the quantitative literature and all the online chatter. I haven't put on the, the reams and reams of data of online chatter around this as well. People wanted access. And that's not just like, can I get in the door? Can I book my vaccine? It's can I even get to the vaccination sites? Um, reassurance. It's OK. You know, we trust you. We believe you. Reward. You know, we talked about those people who are right at the top of the pyramid. They will do anything for anything. Just tell me when. The next group, they actually need a little bit of a nudge. Uh, ease, especially with planning. I loved the idea that you had an app and you can book a time and blah, blah, blah. Our young people go, you want me to book a time for six weeks? I don't know what the fuck I'm doing next week, <laughs> let alone six weeks. I don't know what I'm doing tonight, let alone six weeks. So ease of planning had to be there. Safety. And when we talk about safety, we're not talking about physical safety alone, psychological and social safety. Will people judge me if I did or did not? Or do I feel confident I'm making the right decision? Again, back to that reassurance side. A sense of community. Am I doing this within a space and a place and with people that I feel that I can trust and I feel I belong to? And then finally, there was a strong sense of, I want you to understand me and my needs. I don't like this idea that I am just one part of a wider network and I'm forgotten as an individual, if that makes sense. Quite interesting with that sense of I want to be part of a community, but I also want to be an individual. I'm not saying we understand young people. I have two teenage daughters and I still don't get it. Mm -hmm. But also, I think we can all get that. I want to feel connected, but I also want to be valued as an individual, right? These are pretty universal. Now let's look at what the messaging coming out of Wellington was. It's the right thing to do. You should do it because it's the right thing to do. These are common themes. These are not exact words, obviously. Um, it's been tested and it's safe. Trust, trust, trust us. 
We've tested it. Um, do it now. Now's your time. Young people are sitting there going, no, it's not. We've been told we have to wait until September, you know? But you do it now. But I can't. Do it now. But I, I, I have to plan. All right. Um, do it for others. You know, it's not just about you, it's doing it for others. Wait, I need to take care of me as well right now. You're forgetting about me as an individual. Be kind. The number of people who told me, if I get told one more time to be kind, I'm going to punch someone, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of being told to be kind. Um, it's important. We know that. We know it's important. And also the team of five million, which is true. That sense of community. We are one nation. But where was the, I care about you as an individual as well? And this was some of the sentiment. And sometimes we don't admit this, and it's very difficult to bring forward because it feels a bit selfish, but it's still an innate human need to want to be cared for as an individual. So you can see already a bit of a mismatch. Let's zoom into Delta. Delta kind of kicked off um, a little later on. Um, we were thanked for our data. We were thanked for our insights. We went away, um, and we were, said, we were told, this is not a disease that affects young people. Young people are usually very literate with health. They're very science savvy. They will pick up when it's their turn very, very quickly. It's not going to affect them. It's difficult to see on the graph, but when Delta kicked in, that yellow line is 15 to 24-year-olds. They were the ones that were hit hardest. We know that. They were also the ones who were not adhering because they're like, you know what? I've done enough lockdown, and I want to party. Uh, I'm going to go out and do this. Um, and that's when we got a phone call. At that peak there, we said, hey, can't we need your help? And I said, cool, we're happy to help. So I, we went back in and we started strategizing. We can't fix the whole nation. We were just looking to see what we could do in this area. Now, it's, it felt really sad because I have my colleagues on one side desperately trying to get access over here. And on the other side, the CDHB was desperately coming to me saying, could you please help us? And we're like, let's all work together. Let's, how is the communication so diffuse and so different? But that's a different story when you come to dealing with big organizations. So let's go back to some of those common themes that we found. And let's come up with some solutions. One of the things that the CDHB at the time, now Te Fatu Oro Te Waipunamu, was saying is how about we find a way to get all the people from UC who want to get a vaccine onto a couple of buses out to the vaccination centers and stuff. And I'm like, not great. It's not providing ease of access. It's two or three hours on a bus, even if we fed them, even if we put a DJ on the bus, all this stuff. I believe the words Akant's COVID vaccination party bus were used in a memo <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and I was just trying to think, if you won't come to us, how can we make it fun for them? In the end, they conceded that the best thing to do was to try and tick these things off. And that meant doing some vaccinations close by to which meant these were all ticked off. So what we did, very simply, we had it on campus. We gave people a burger. We had walk-ins, no appointments. You did not need to book this in advance. Guides and supporters. So as you came in, someone would say, hi, are you coming in for your first or second vaccine? Oh, first, cool. Come this way. Let's get your thing. There was that sort of monarchy, that sort of love that was there, which just provided a little bit of safety and reassurance that some people needed. We also used the room of requirement for those people who need a little bit more quietness, and it was for those people who need a little bit more space or specifically nervous and not in a big room. And you can come with your friends. We had a lot of people come as part of communities to support their friends. We had people queuing up for two and a half hours for a vaccine. Less time than if they'd got on the bus, had a party, got to the thing, come back. But because it was on campus, because they knew it, because they're around their friends, because there was a burger at the end, because they felt part of a community, because everyone was queuing up, it made it much easier for them to join in. Over the three days that we ran this, so we, um, uh, we ran this across two days to start with, and then we had a booster session or a second jab session a few weeks later at the three-month mark. We vaccinated 2,500 people in the region. I think it was actually a little more. It might have been up to 3,000 people. And all it was, we just needed to advertise this. Once we'd created the thing, the product, the service, we just needed to make sure people knew about this. I want to give a shout out to a few people who were instrumental in this. Uh, this is the team who were helping. On the left-hand side, there is uh, Ripeka Tamanui Huranui, who did pretty much everything to do with this. I had these high-level coffees and meetings and stuff like that. I did that with those people. Ripeka made this happen. She worked day after day, hour after hour, to make sure that all the operations were taken care of. So big shout out to Ripeka. And in the middle here, we have Katie, who helped me with the research, and um, Rosa Hibitskuna, who um, also helped from, with our Māori students. She was the president of Te Akitoki at the time, the student, uh, Māori student representatives. Now, I 
think I'm really cool. I'm also 43. Look at these nods going, yeah, you think you're cool. I know you think you're cool. I'm also 43. I am not the right person to advertise this. Rosa and Katie did a lot of the marketing around this by young people for young people. Rosa opened a TikTok account just for this flipping thing, and she hates me for it <laughs> that she had to open the TikTok, but that worked. Um, to her credit, Katie, amongst not just this work but other works, also won the award uh, from Waitaha Canterbury Youth Awards for the best youth work in the, in the region as a result of this work and other work, knowing how much hard work went into making these things happen. Katie is currently in Europe on her OE. She sent me a picture of the south of Spain villa she's in for the next five weeks, and I said, I hope it's got cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could do a whole hour lecture just on how this played out online. We're already out of time, so I need to stop. Um, but similar things were happening. Going back to those needs before, these are sort of the messaging that was happening online. And I was trying to warn people way back in May that this is playing out much more effectively than your advertising campaign on TV or radio, which young people aren't engaging with. People are telling them all these sorts of things, which are very alluring because they match up with their needs. It's not a straight line as we did with our interventions, but it still had the same sort of effect. These sorts of messages are very powerful, especially when you feel marginalized, or you feel you're not being heard, or you feel that you're not getting your own sense of belonging associated with this. Um, again, I could go in for hours. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this thing called the bad news game. This was de developed well before the pandemic, and it was there to address fake news and misinformation, disinformation. And it's developed by Cambridge University. You can go onto it and you can play it yourself. But it's a tool to help young people in particular how to become deceivers, how to go online and become conspiracy theorists. The idea being that if you know the tools of the conspiracy theorist to use emotion, to divide, to tell lies but tell them um, subtly enough, to impersonate, all these sorts of things, you'll be able to spot that better. It builds critical thinking skills and it draws on what we call inoculation theory, bit of a pun when it comes to here, but it draws an inoculation theory that if you know a little, you're prepared and you're taught what to see when it comes to the real world. So please go play the band news game. I have got all the trophies. I'm that good a troll. Um, some takeaways from, from what I've said and also what Stacy said. I, if, you, if we do have medical professionals here, my parents, um, yeah, my dad is a real doctor. My older brother is a real doctor. My mum calls me a PhD, which stands for phony doctor, not real doctor. Um, so I come from a family of medical scientists who, who kind of look at marketing in the same way sometimes engineers do, but now kind of see the value of it. But marketing's not a dirty word. Marketers are sometimes the worst people at marketing marketing. But people hear you from marketing and you think you must be the devil because we cause so much harm. I'm not going to deny that marketing has caused harm. There's a lot of good that can come from this as well. Understanding people is a big, big advantage. Uh, understanding social engagements is fundamental to any work we do. Just because it's scientifically the right thing to do doesn't mean socially people are going to jump into it. Sense of community matters. And those people who feel marginalized are, and not being seen are the ones that are going to really hurt, especially if that voice becomes powerful. If those people who feel like there is a stronger sense of community over here, even if that is not scientifically factual, people will gravitate here. And so we need to find a way that we can bring people together, show that manaki, show that araha, bring people closer together so we don't get that. So we're going to finish this off together with um, uh, some questions and some closing remarks. Um, what are your thoughts? What are, what are some, do you have a closing remark you want to make? Or? Oh, and Angela. Get some wave from Angeline and, and Emily. They're going to be running around with a micro No, they're not. They've just looked at me like, no, we're not going to run around. <laughs> if, you, if you would like to ask a question, please respect the time that people have. Please make sure it's a question. If you've got a comment, come see us afterwards. Um, and we'll repeat the question for the live streamers. Sir, what was your question? Can I ask two? You can ask one, and then we'll give another go. Back and then we'll come back to you. Don't worry. Yeah. Do you think it is uh, intrinsically uh, opposing, uh, systematically so different? Sure. Then, for example, the double blind test, should the indigenous, whether in New Zealand, the Chinese, or should pass the double blind sure. test? Like, 
it's a, it's a great it's a great debate happening at the moment. I'm not Māori. We're not Māori. We can't speak to indigenous knowledge within New Zealand. What I can tell you is that indigenous knowledge doesn't mean it's not science. Okay. Um, I know that I, I've, I work closely with Tamari, who's the Upoko from Mana Whenua here during that time, and he's like, I just wish they would give us the vaccine because we would be able to vaccinate our people because we know what motivates them. What draws Māori together is very different sometimes from what Pākehā. There was a story coming out of, um, and I could talk about, we had a Māori and Pacific um, clinic and we had a Pākehā or general clinic, completely different, completely different. And you know what the vibe and the sense of closeness from the Māori and Pacific Clinic was so strong and it felt completely stripped away from the general clinic. We could learn so much as a general population from what was done there that we don't. So I think there's benefits from both sides. So yes, I believe in science. Yes, I believe in indigenous knowledge. It is not an either or, there can be an and-and. Do you want to add anything? Yes, and just the idea that what marketing teaches us is that you understand choice as something much broader than any set of numbers. Yeah. And so that really is about um, that one size fits all uh, idea is, is just very bad in understanding anybody's choice. We really need to think. Um, more than once, yeah. Yes, in a, in, a, in a much more diverse way. So. Yes. Yes, you and Mm. Uh, vaccination because it, it seemed like the official campaign kind of just ignored it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the. And, yeah. and so the, ra the rate of um, disinformation by age group became yeah. quite skewed. And, and ethnicity. So, the, the comment is that. Is there a comment or a, um, a response to the, the way that disinformation was spread out? Because it seemed like the official channels just ignored it. Um, but there was a lot of diffusion of that amongst certain populations, young people in particular, TikTok, um, Māori and Pacific especially. It was a lot of disinformation spread and a lot of people who absorbed this. Um, yeah, I could do a whole lecture uh, on that alone. Um, what was drawing that? Again, just a sense of community, sense of feeling powerful and belong, sense of feeling seen. Um, uh, there's, I, I have to keep reminding myself that 99% of the people out there who are in these groups are the deceived, not the deceivers. Very few genuinely want to hurt people and know they're hurting people, but they still are repeating this or sharing this because they feel that it is true because we trust Auntie X more so than Dr. Y, if that makes sense, because our medical profession has focused so much on fixing people's health and not building relationships, and that does matter. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, so in the, um, in the article that, um, that Mohamed Pate and um, Kevin Schulman and I did in British Medical Journal, we really talk about that one because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine piece that you really have to um, address negative attributions. You have to, you have to be assertive. Mm. Um, and a lot of the medical um, population just felt like, look, it's silly and therefore no one will believe it. Um, and again, it's that, that sort of like, it's a very scientific mindset of, I will give you the facts and the statistics and you will now do the right thing. Um, and not realizing that anecdotes are more powerful. Yeah. And a lot of misinformation is an anecdote, not a statistic. Um, so uh, we, when we um, published that in the England Me Journal of Medicine, um, there were, we got pushback on it. Maybe we shouldn't really do that. But when we did the study worldwide, we found that that was one of the global things that was consistent across all seven regions, was that it was important in every area that you listened for misinformation and you, directly, you directly addressed it in fact, um, one story we heard out of Botswana that um, the Botswana government didn't want to promote any good information about the vaccine until they had it in hand to start passing out because they didn't want to tell people they should, they should want it and not have it in the country ready to go. Mm. Um, except for the fact that the people who were telling them that they didn't want it were happy to start early. Absolutely. So by the time the good information got to Botswana, there had already been six months of misinformation. Yep. And so, again, it's... Um, I, I really think that the health providers have just such a hope that it's all going to work out and a belief that people will just look at, you know, what's been recommended and do it. Um, um, but, you know, Apple knows that you don't sell phones that way and, um, you know, yeah. that's not the way you sell cereal it's, either. <laughs> and, and this is one of the first things I said to the team in May is that you've got your 
all your vaccination centers in these warehouse style facilities that are on the side of town or they're hidden in a, a pharmacy or something like that, have people queuing up in Eastgate Mall at the loft where people can see them to say, I'm like that person, they're getting it, I feel connected now. But they weren't willing to do that. They were concerned of whatever it was, rushes on the vaccine, security reasons, but just having simple access. Ma'am there, and then we'll come here, yeah. Absolutely. We, we had a really good meeting up at the University of Auckland. I don't know if this is a bit of a competitive thing, but they were very keen to get us involved in their medical science up there. So go tell your friends. No, um, <laughs> no it's quite serious. So I've yeah. been giving talks at, um, at medical schools all around the US, and this is my point. Please put any kind of class on decision making. You don't have to call it marketing if no. that's a bad word. Um, call it clinical decision making. Medical Make decision it, making, yeah. Make it a, a, a one-day workshop, um, but it's interesting because I give this grand round lecture, and everyone's like, "That's amazing! Yes, we should do that." And then, you know, then things go on their own way. So I think it has to be a bit of a groundswell. It's, I do think the yeah. pandemic has made us a lot more mindful For of sure. how people choose. And it's as much our job as it is the medical scientists to come to us. Like, we were up in Auckland giving these talks, and they were talking about, "So you treat different people differently?" Like. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I rudely said, you've got to understand, when I teach first year marketing, the idea of people being different and having different needs and we have to respond differently is class number two or three in a student's journey in marketing. It's so basic that we start there. Well, it's different. We haven't, yeah, so in medicine, it's yeah. the standard of care, right? And, right. That, and it's equity. You treat everyone the same, same because it's equitable. And it's the standard of care. There's one best practice, oh. um, and it, they're just, there's, it's a it's a little bit of a shift. Sure, and there's also the the economies of scale issue as well. I have to treat so many people. How can I come up with multiple messages? We can teach that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to identify myself as both a doctor and an engineer. Nice. <laughs> My question is around with your the twelve behavioural health tactics. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you have your world bank sign up. Mm -hmm. um, you said that they were with everything. Do you mention what sign was it? Like? Mm -hmm. Do you mention what sign was it? And I I work both with student health and specific populations. So mm -hmm. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. I'm going to let you repeat the question. Okay, so the question is, of the 12 tactics, I mentioned the ones that were pretty global, which ones weren't that global? Which ones had regional mm. differences? Um, so one that really surprised me was the compromise effect. Mm. So I told you, told you guys a compromise effect because it is the most robust effect I see in my career. Um, and so I thought that as long as you always present the vaccine as a middle option, that will, um, that will make it more attractive. And when we found that there were some regions of the world where um, that being the middle was the most polite and therefore it was the nicest. And there are other places where it was wishy-washy. If you did not have an opinion, if it was not the most or the least, then it could not be true. And that was just really, that was an interesting, um, an interesting take on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the other uh, one that was really interesting to me was um, leverage scarcity. So in, the idea of leveraging scarcity is something that marketers often do, right? So marketers, like the makers of um, new technological products, will often underproduce what they know is demand so that they can have big you know, news stories that say, you know, oh, we sold out on the first day. And everyone's like, oh, I should have gotten that. It makes it seem more desirable. And nobody wanted to do that with the vaccine. Right? Nobody wanted to be like, oh, let's make sure we, we say we ran out of vaccines you know, in the first hour. No, nobody wanted to do that. So we didn't really leverage scarcity. And I understand that there are medical reasons we didn't. But what was interesting, um, so uh, yeah, you can see why. Um, sometimes, honestly, when I talk to doctors, they're like, you can't do that. I was like, I know, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, but here's the interesting thing about scarcity is that um, uh, in two African countries, um, uh, looking at Botswana versus um, Niger, um, and I think Mali as well. But um, in Niger, if you gave the, um, 
if you said the vaccine is scarce and special and you gave it to the most elite of society first, everybody wanted it. It actually worked better to trickle down. Mm -hmm. But in Botswana, it was the exact opposite. If you didn't give it to everybody to, to kind of like the, they, they had um, rules where um, the people who were able to get it first didn't even have to be citizens. And so they were like, wow. because what we think is what's sacred and special to us should be shared. Mm. And therefore, it comes from the bottom up. And that's just a cultural thing, right? Top down or bottom up. Um, but I thought that was interesting because, again, like there are two countries in one continent that are actually quite different. Yeah. So looking for those nuances, again, looking for the nuances New, is important and nuances. worthwhile. And I wasn't part of this study, but one of them was um, creating FOMO. Oh, yeah. And that doesn't work all the time with health. Um, some of you will know that we will be, we will be smoke-free in two years' time. Did you know this? So New Zealand will be smoke-free in 2025. When that was announced, we studied people who purposely took up smoking because they didn't like the government telling them what to do. They don't want to smoke. They don't want to take in tobacco. But, I, but they're damn, afraid of missing out on it. <laughs> afraid, well, telling someone, oh, you might miss out or something. Actually, some people are like, I want to actively be divisive and cause trouble. What we're also seeing is a huge uptick in um, vaping now as well, uh, and by people who would never have smoked. So the feeling of missing out is, is different. We're gonna take one more. Are there any questions on the, the chat? Okay, we're gonna take two more, but we've already got the, from our volunteers. So Nancy, and then we'll come over here. Is that all right? Is that the same with seatbelts? Uh, well, seatbelts has become a cultural thing as well, you know? And this is what I teach when I, when I talk about anti-tobacco. No one stops smoking tobacco because of an education campaign. They stop smoking usually because it's become a cultural thing, because it's not cool anymore, because their girlfriend or their boyfriend has told them they don't want to kiss them, blah, blah, blah. Most people that smoke know it's hurting them. They just don't care. So if you dumb down my entire health promotion career, it is people do things that hurt them either because they don't know it's hurting them or they don't care. The government spends all its time on education making people know the vast majority of bad health behaviors is because people don't care. They know they don't care. So seatbelts, people know and care because they've seen the carnage associated with it and they've got personal experience. The people that don't wear seatbelts don't care, but that's a tiny minority. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Um, the, uh, let's finish off with the, what is the marketing lens on mandating vaccination? The marketing lens on mandating ma vaccination, what it was a mass appeal approach to say, this is what we are gonna create as being socially normative. So if you go back to our psychological theories, uh, theory of planned behavior is probably one of the best known theories of trying to encourage behavioral change. And one of the things that theory of planned behavior says is that we make decisions based on what we think is important versus what we think society think is normative. By creating a mandate, I believe the government was trying to decide this is normative. This is normal, this is right. And as a result, whatever you think is gonna be countercultural, therefore you are wrong. For me, I would rather encourage people get to do this rather than feel they have to do this. However, if I was a patient in the hospital, I would like to know that everyone was vaccinated. And so we have this tension in my mind between do I want to be in a space where there's lots of unvaccinated people trying to get healthcare when I might be vulnerable versus actually I don't want people to feel forced into doing something just to keep their job. That doesn't seem like the best way to get people to feel included in a thing. Do you want to yeah, obviously one of the things in marketing is about choice. Hmm. And so a mandate is not a choice. Um, and so in some ways I see a lot of health mandates probably because we're not that good at encouraging choices in a particular direction. I mean, none of us are mandated to buy a computer, but I bet most of us have one because it's just hard to do life without it. So there are many things in which um, the choice aspect of it is a bit debatable. Um, a lot of doctors I talk to really like nudges. So nudge, there's a book uh, called Nudge by Richard Thaler, and it's all about all the small little ways that you can frame a choice that makes the thing that society or some greater organization want to happen happen. And the reason why um, they are seen as desirable is that they maintain autonomy. People have a choice. So it's like um, uh, organ donation. Uh, so do you opt in or do you opt out? of organ donation when you sign up for your driver's license. In the US, most of the time, people would have to opt in. Um, it would say, they would say, do you wanna be an organ donor? And I'd be like, well, what's my default? No, you're not. And then you'd have to opt in and that felt weird. 
they radically changed the rates of organ donation just by saying to people, you're automatically an organ donor unless you want to opt out. And then people are like, oh, well, that feels weird. No, that's normal. Yeah. yeah. And so like those are nudges, little things that do not take any freedom away, but that shift um, things to be a little healthier, safer. So I think um, when you see the popularity of nudges, it's for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging um, and yet not um, removing freedoms. So I, 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 if you haven't guessed already, my default position that the vaccine is good and that health is good, and so I am a pro-vaccination person. However, when we talk about the online space in particular, having a mandate does arm people who are willing to spread bad information because they said, there we go, the government is doing this, whatever else it might be, it actually doesn't bring us together. It doesn't help the government feel closer to you, and it doesn't make people feel like they belong, especially when you're being forced into something. So from a human behavior side, I can see the negatives associated with mandates from a social consumption side. I can see the benefits from actually from a, from a health side. So uh, yeah, it is, it is a difficult conversation, but there are pros and cons to both. It is not easy. We are getting glared at. So I am going to wrap it up. Thank and you so much. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it.